during the Reformation with Patrick uh, uh, Hamilton, who was the second son of the brother to the king. Yes. And that was the first sacrifice and the only sacrifice of Luther yeah. at St. Andrews. Yeah, yeah and these, these images, because this prayer, this Eucharistic prayer, speaks of the incorruptibility of the spirit. This is a Eucharistic idea that we don't, we sometimes resist it in our Lutheran thinking, maybe to our detriment. But the early Christians, by and large, thought of the Eucharistic presence as being instantiated even as the incarnation was instantiated. If you are going to talk about the real presence of the body of Christ, then the Holy Spirit was the one who kind of enacted that. He, he was made man by way of being begotten from above by way of spirit and the flesh of the Virgin Mary. And so the bread was, was an incorruptible bread because it was the body of Christ which was perfused by the Spirit of God. And so we are told in this martyrdom that as the flames picked up, there came a wind. And the flames took the form of a of a ship's sail. And the martyr was himself unhurt by the flames. Why? Because this the, the wind is pneuma in the Greek. The same word is spirit. <clears throat> so here was the image that the Christians saw that while the pagans may see the fire surrounding him, what the Christians saw was in fact the making incorruptible of Bishop Polycarp. And because of that, and we'll allude to this again later in my, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself in all sundry kinds of places, they take his bones and they bury them in what they call a suitable place. That doesn't mean hidden from whoever. It means a place where they can come back every year on the anniversary date of his martyrdom and have a Eucharistic service there. And that Eucharistic service then, at the place of the martyr's incorruptible body, it's the first thing, it's the first testament we have of the growing martyr cultus, which could get out of hand, but in these early texts, it simply has this faith that the death of the saint in fact, ushers in for him or her the incorruption of the body. And that is the reality, which is fundamentally the reality of Christ, which is partaken of in the Eucharistic bread and wine. So they, they wouldn't mind John 6 as Eucharistic. The flesh which I give for the life of the world or the bread which I give for the life of the world is my flesh. Or as the Third Ecumenical Council put it, the life-giving flesh of Christ. So, and these were all appropriated into martyr context because the martyr was the kind of the pure manifestation of this reality, of, of God's final work of life-giving by way of the death of his son. The fundamental idea was that in the death of Christ, death was itself defeated, and therefore the organic and intrinsic content of the cross was in fact the resurrection life itself. Implication. The resurrection life itself assumed the form of the cross whether that be by way of martyrdom or by way of charity or mercy or what, however that might be manifested in various circumstances of the Christian soldier. Nonetheless, the life of resurrection was not the life of power that my portfolio was going to grow down. And I'm going to be free of all kinds of pains and maladies. No, I mean, that was just a bunch of spiritual nonsense. And so, the, the resurrection life, again, was the life of what Paul would call humility and love and long-suffering and faith. 
Those are the forms that the cross takes in the life of the question. Well, I, we have five minutes to go, and I'm not going to pay any attention to you people. <laughs> I'm just going to read here for my own edification. You can listen if you want. <laughs> the death of the martyr was therefore not merely the punishment that earthly powers meted out to those who create, were create, uh, create, courageous enough to give public testimony. The death of the martyr was itself a manifestation, a witness and demonstration that in Christ God had overcome death by the new creation of the resurrection. In his letter to the church at Smyrna, Bishop Ignatius, on his way to his own martyrdom, writes against the Docetists who denied that Christ had risen from the dead in the flesh. Ignatius writes, I both know and believe that also after the resurrection, Christ was in flesh. For indeed, when he came to those who were about Peter, around Peter, he said to them, take, take hold of me, Feel me and see that I am not a bodiless spirit. And straightway they touched him and believed. And for that very reason they despised death and were found to be superior to death. Now what is in fact saying is that by way of their touching, this, this is the language of participation, right? Taking hold of, being united to, they were found to be above death, they despised it, and were found to be, found to be superior to death. That's speaking of their martyrdoms. They were actually brought to death and were found to be superior to it by not giving in to it, but remaining steadfast. As I say, this last statement connects the martyr experience directly to the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. However, the martyr experience is connected not merely to the belief that Jesus rose from the dead. The martyr experience is connected to the ongoing experience of the resurrected Jesus. Like the confrontation of Jesus with Thomas, the above statement from Ignatius, taken as it is from the Gospel of Luke, presents in fact a Eucharistic scene. Immediately after the above words, Ignatius continues. To be sure, after the resurrection, Jesus ate and drank with them as one who is of the flesh. Although he was reunited by way of spirit, meaning his deity, with the Father. It is very evident that early Christians thought about the reality of martyrdom as a Christian reality and consciously prepared themselves for this eventuality. Moreover, it is evident that the context of this reflection was more often than not a liturgical gathering in which the resurrection of the Lord was celebrated and his real presence acknowledged. Our very first evidence of an emerging martyr cultus, and I just re spoke to you about it, so we'll conclude our morning session with this repetition. In the martyrdom of Polycarp, written around 155 <coughs> or 6, we are told that upon the death of Polycarp, the Christians gathered his bones and buried them in a suitable place. What made this location suitable is then described. Gathering here, as we can, in joy and gladness. The language of joy and gladness is almost always a Eucharistic marker. The Lord will permit us to celebrate, epitele, to celebrate by way of a, this was the language of cultus, by way of a cultic administration. What Pastor Ware does on in a, what we call administering the Lord's Supper, the Greek word would be epitelene. Okay. 
And so we are going to celebrate, we are going to, by way of a liturgical occurrence, the birthday of his martyrdom. Both as a memorial for those who have already struggled, as well as for the training and preparation of those who will in, in the future struggle. It is always interesting too how often the martyrdom of the martyr was a birthday. It's kind of a, a baptismal image, right? And it's a, another way of saying a new life has begun out of non-existence, if you will, death. The language of the martyrdom of Polycarp suggests then that on the anniversary date of Polycarp's martyrdom, the Christian community gathered at the place of his burial and there commemorated the death of past martyrs, probably through the reading of martyr narratives, such as the martyrdom of Polycarp itself. They added then to the, if that's the case, they added to the reading of the martyr narrative, both prayer and exhortation, to prepare the living for future suffering. The language, moreover, suggests that this took place within, or certainly in conjunction with, a Eucharistic service. And it is instructive to note that the Eucharist was regarded as a proper occasion for martyrological reflection. To commune with the body and blood of Christ was to be bound with him, who was himself the faithful witness, and received the crown of life. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Union then with Christ's body and blood unites the faithful to the goal and destiny of Christian faith, namely to that perfection whereby the confession of the mouth is instantiated by the sacrifice of one's own life for that true confession. The death of the martyr was then itself witness and demonstration that in Christ God had overcome death by the new creation of resurrection. Participation in the suffering of the Lord therefore, therefore bears within itself the destiny of martyrdom, should that be according to God's will and purpose. And so as we think about the present circumstances of our own churches in the world and about how best to prepare our people for faithful confession and potential future suffering, we should not forget the great resource we have in the sacrament of the altar. For the supper is not merely that which strengthens faith, but is itself the reality of life over death. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I shall raise him up on the last day. Well, uh, it's time for lunch, as I see, and at least Pastor Ware's stomach is really grumbling. I don't know if you can hear it. <laughs> so we'll pause right here, and we'll pick that up uh, whenever we're supposed to. So, but any quick questions or comments that before we? Yes, sir. Um, about the, you know, the apostles and the martyrdom and the message Second Corinthians. Filling, filling up the cup of suffering. Right. <coughs> filling up in my flesh and laughing at the <coughs> for the sake of his body in church. Absolutely. And deeply martyrological undertones to that passage. They're very good <coughs> in which the cup of suffering, clearly taken from an Old Testament image that we find in the Gethsemane story. Uh, so the idea was not that Jesus' death was incomplete and needed addition. It was that the, the eschatological, and by that term I mean that the final purposes of God, so to speak, reach out beyond that particular time. And so the world at all times and in all places must be confronted by the cup of suffering which was that of Jesus. That cup of suffering, they can only be filled up really by the missiological, <coughs> evangelical, martyrological witness to the world, which 
which involves then the church in the in the very suffering of Jesus. Very thank you for a very good passage. Okay, thank you very much for your attention.